Okay, so this presentation is really about how do you change the landscape? What are we missing? Where are the gaps? What, how could we move faster? I think there's everyone in this audience would like to go faster, get approvals faster, get access easier. Um, so I think I'll start with Jane and say, Jane, you know, what's up with you? You're in the, so the DRIS consortium is something that we've invested in as well as the CTAP consortium. These are consortiums really dr driven to look at data and try to really understand different aspects of the data to see if you can do better trials, faster trials, and, and really make more sense of this and maybe get some surrogates in the meantime. So Jane, you take it from here. Sure. Sounds like this is on. So um, to my mind, one of the things that we really need in this field over time is a really solid understanding of natural history, how it varies between patients, how, vary, how we can identify how different patients are going to progress with the disease. And that's something we've been working on for a couple of years with PPMD support. We've brought together data that's already been collected, natural history data, clinical data where it's been concerned, placebo arm of natural hi history, uh, sorry, placebo arm of clinical trials aggregated into a database, and we're using that database to tr really try and understand how the disease progresses relative to different endpoints, which endpoints are likely to change in particular patients, so that for each patient out there, we can look at an appropriate out outcome measure that will change in a given period of time. And the idea behind that, which is fairly sophisticated mathematical modeling that my modelers are doing, is that we'll be able to um, have relatively small, relatively short trials that still give us that statistical um, significance that the FDA wants to approve treatments. We really want to get to definitive answers quickly. Sometimes, unfortunately, that definitive answer will be no, but we want to get rid of those, those drugs, move on with the ones that look good, get them out to patients as fast as possible. So I think there's a huge value in getting as much of that data from every one of you together into a database so we can understand as well as possible what variables are affecting that progression in the population so we can develop these really quick, efficient trials that are still very informative. And I have to say thank you to everybody who's shared data with us, and thank you to everyone I know. There are a lot of industry members in the audience who are part of this consortium. Um, this is something we're doing together as a field in the pre-competitive space, and I think it really will move the needle. And to add to that, the database we're building, we're trying to get that data to other people and other groups who are doing different kinds of modeling, because they too can use it for different, for different goals, different, um, different things you can do with data. That data is valuable, and we have to say thank you to everybody for sharing with us and with all the other consortia out there who are using the data for various other purposes to help the field move forwards. Good, thank you. So can you talk about the first project that you're doing? So, that, so basically, data sets came into to DRISC or the, the uh, DRISC consortium. Yeah, they were put in the language of CDISC and then they were in, all the data was integrated. And so your first project is looking at? Sure, so we, we use these things called CDISC standards to integrate data so all of that data can be combined into one big data set. That's really nice. We have over a thousand patients worth of data over the course of disease. What we're planning on doing is modeling disease progression from it's about age five up because we don't have enough data in the younger patients. We'd love to be able to do the younger patients as well, but we don't have the data right now. And we're going to be modeling progression as related to the time to stand from supine, the time to climb four stairs, um, the, the velocity of the 10 meter walk run, and, and force vital capacity, which will cover the older patients. And on top of that, we're modeling in these milestones, loss of ability to climb stairs, loss of ability to walk, loss of ability to raise your hands, um, time to ventilate use. So all the way across disease, we have milestones of disease. So we hope that in the long term, we'll be able to use each one of those, these endpoints in these very precise populations, mathematically predicted who's into which population and what your endpoint would be, so that we can use these models to really predict, clinical uh, predict how a clinical trial might go. That has the advantage we might be able to reduce the size of a placebo data set. We're not going to get away from placebo data sets, but we might be able to reduce that. We might be able to use smaller trials. We might be able to use shorter trials and still come to those definitive answers. I should say we've worked very closely with FDA throughout this process. They are, we have a liaison assigned to our consortium. They're, they, um, they're buying into the plans. We've discussed them with them. They didn't like our first plan. They told us that. We adjusted our plans. So we're pretty sure the models that we're going to develop will be acceptable to them. We're starting to go through the formal fit-for-purpose pathway soon. We'll be also doing equivalent pathways at EMA and potentially eventually in Japan as well. Because these are supposed to be regulatory tools that the regulators will accept. <coughs> Companies can use without arguing about them and we'll be able to move forwards more quickly and more efficiently. Good, thank you. So Stan, what do you see as the biggest challenge? Or some way we can move the needle faster? Uh, I think there's a lot of ways. I think one of the things that's actually uh, we've heard throughout the 
day at various times is actually all of us using our data together. I think actually the Duchenne registry is key. It allows us to learn from the patient community. One of the things I love within that is to find individuals who are outliers. So the people who are not having the typical Duchenne course, but with a null mutation in the dystrophin gene, studying the biomarkers that are within that, which includes genomics, it includes potentially muscle biopsies, it includes blood markers as well. I think those are uh, key things to gather. I think the other thing which, you know, where we as a community will get excited about various therapies coming along, which of course gene therapy and the data we saw today is remarkable. Um, but, you know, we'll have to deal with the issue of, you know, prior AAV uh, exposure, uh, immune tolerance, how do you redose, how do we target the stem cell, and the time to start working on that is is now because those will eventually be, if, even if successful in the current state, it will be issues in the fairly near-term future. I think we want to brace to do all those. And how do you think we could get to combinations faster? Yeah, so I think uh, combinations, yeah, I, I like the idea of a master protocol. I like the idea of uh, combinatorial actual studies. I actually think the patient registry data provides us a means to look at you know, multivariate analysis so you can determine what the individual contributions of different uh, treatments that people are choosing to use. So I think you know, dealing with the issue of you know, didn't do nutritional supplements or nutritional differences, things that don't need a prescription, do they make an impact? We can study those if we collect the data in a, in a reasonably systematic way. I think actually moving clinical trials forward where you're co-testing multiple different independent therapeutics is, is great, and that would be a fantastic way to move things forward much quicker. It's a very complex drug trial strategy, but other diseases and you know, brain tumor and the like uh, treatments are moving forward in that model. Thank you. So Annie? So that's a loaded question, but yeah. I'm going to zero in on one thing. <clears throat> so. Um, we at PPMD have been leading a newborn screening effort for the last four years. And in this room, we have families who are already diagnosed. So you probably wonder why newborn screening. So I'll tell you why. So I started attending the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders and Newborns and Children, another crazy acronym in Washington. But that's the federal committee that determines what conditions get added to the federal newborn screening panel. And I started attending that meeting <clears throat> many, many years ago. And the first time I went, I sat next to a woman who in her lap had a picture of a beautiful six-year-old boy who had blonde hair and blue eyes, and that was his first grade photo. And that was the last photo she ever had taken of her son. And it turns out her son, soon after that photo, was diagnosed with X-linked ALD, which was a disorder that could have been detected had there been newborn screening because it was treatable through a cord, tra a cord transplant. Sitting next to her was her nephew, a very healthy, strapping high schooler who also had X-linked ALD and was diagnosed because his cousin had been diagnosed with it and died shortly after that picture was taken. She was sitting next to me and this was her third consecutive year coming to this meeting and appealing to this committee to add X-linked ALD to the newborn screening panel. It is still not on the newborn screening panel because it is a very complex system to get conditions added to the federal newborn screening panel and then to states. And at that moment, we vowed that that would not be the case for Duchenne, that we would not have approved therapies and when we look at our pipeline, that could alter the course of disease in Duchenne for newborns and have families only learn about it four or five years later and learn that the optimal window for intervention had been missed because we didn't have newborn screening available. So we stood up a very aggressive, comprehensive infrastructure four years ago to start to work on all of the pieces and elements that we would have to build so that when we did have therapies with broad labels, and we now have one, Exondus 51, that could be made available to families when their children were diagnosed, we would be able to start to move towards newborn screening. We have had two pilots in the US. 
One was done in Western Pennsylvania, one was done in Ohio. We are moving towards one more major pilot in the US. And this is tracking with where we are in our therapy pipeline. Because again, we have vowed that we will not be the community that has life altering therapies sitting on the shelf and families that don't learn about it in time to have the optimal benefit. <clears throat> so that's something that PPMD has been working on. You'll hear more about it. And we're grateful to all the federal agency partners and all the industry partners who've been working with us. Um, but that will also help us expand labels that will help us optimize the therapies that are coming down the pipeline. And it's something that we are very committed to ensuring moves forward for Duchenne. Good, thanks, Annie. Um, Kathy, so what's the most frustrating thing or you think the thing that if we fix this, the rest would be easy? XALD was added to the Rust. It took a while. Recently, it now, right. It is yeah. now on the Rust. It was recommended to the secretary and it was signed off on. So we're, there were three conditions in that one round, MPS1 and pump, you know, MPS1 uh, and XALD were added. And it took so, them like a decade to do that. Yeah, yeah. so it, it yeah, took a thank while. You. Yeah. Yeah. And SKID's another example where it took them several decades to get it done. And we don't want to be, and hi, it's nice to meet you. Yeah. And we don't want to, and you're one of the partners that we're grateful to be well, meet, to Well, and, be and just with. very briefly to add to this, I got to know Hugo and Ann Moser because of XALD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hugo died of pancreatic cancer. I saw him two or three weeks before he passed away. He was in the hospital lying in bed and we shook hands and he had just signed, on, the, on his way to surgery, he had signed off on the study to get the evidence to show that XALD was, so, you know, these are, I mean, I get emotional about this and I've not been affected personally by, by these things, so it's a very important thing. Thank, thank you for bringing Thank you for that. So, Annie, just one quick comment from you before I go to Kathy. Yep. Um, once you get, uh, you submit the package to the Rust and there's a decision made, that's not the end of the story, is it? No. Mm -mm. So it's a system where you have to go state by state to have a condition added once there's a federal addition. So the screening that you have when you have a baby is different in every state in the U.S. or many states in the U.S. So that's just the begin. it's the next step in the story. And so the work we've been doing is to try and shorten the timelines really between when we have an addition to the RUSP and then the state implementation. And so we have a lot of partners who are actually here in the room with us, CDC's one, we have Perkin Elmer here, who've been working with us to get all those pieces ready so that when we are ready to submit a package to the recommended uniform screening panel, we can hopefully shorten some of the timelines between the federal implementation and state implementation because there's just a lot of work involved, which is part of the reason why you have conditions like SCID and CF that were added to the Rust many years ago and are still not screened for in every state. Thank you. Okay, Kathy, so how can we make things go faster, quicker? Oh, I, your question was how, I, the first one was how can I fix everything? That well, was why, the hardest if you can question. Do that, why don't you do that then? Well, I thought that was tough. Huh? Um, so we can cure this and that would be just fine with me. So let's just do that. Um, but until we do that, I think what we need to do is um, care is really important. And we have a network of 18 centers across the country that are providing the best care for this diagnosis. And even in my mind, this ties everything together. So as these babies are diagnosed with, uh, with newborn screening, as we start to develop master protocol, as we look for uh, combination therapies, as we collect data for the Critical Path Institute. Hopefully all of that data will come through these 18 care centers and, and more of those certified Duchenne care centers. Um, and then those, those families and those patients will continue to be followed through those centers. And um, those results and that care will bring all of these therapies from bench to bedside much quicker. So, and help us to cure this and solve the whole problem, Pat. Well, thanks for solving sure, that. Sure, no um, problem. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so Abby. Tell us, what, you, you told us the, um, just yesterday about the ma uh, ma platform design. Um, I'll get that lingo down. <laughs> just, just, just if only it was an acronym, building. right? I'd get it right the first time, I'm sure. Um, so, so I think that the companies struggle to get these sites up and running. And I've heard that sometimes it takes two months to get a site up and running, and sometimes it takes more than a year to get a site up and running. So tell us how you envision this going down and what that could mean in terms of time. Yeah, so, I mean, for any of you that were here and uh, here last night and heard me speak, you know 
I think the future lies in apartment buildings. Um, <laughs> Because that's the, but that's the model, that's the analogy I used last night about how a platform trial could speed up things. Because if there's, there's certain shared infrastructure, there's shared processes that every single clinical trial has to set up, something that Pat just talked about. Um, so if we can, those things that every single sponsor is doing, all the companies are doing at sites, and all the processes that the sites have to do, if you can somehow do that once, one time, and set it up so that it doesn't have to be torn down and set up again, I think things, the sites, the studies would be started more quickly, then we could start recruiting more quickly, we could get those trials, we could get trials started more quickly, evaluate and test the drugs, and if they fail, have them stopped, have them dropped out, and something else put in more quickly. Um, so I think it really boils down to collaboration. This all takes a lot of collaboration. And I think that that was my ask last night, is that we all look around and we all say, yes, we are going to work together and we're going to collaborate, and together we can really try to make a difference and speed things up. Thanks. So, Stan, you've been looking at more severe and least severe and doing some work around that. Can you tell us if you've gained some insights about that that would help contribute to moving things a little more rapidly? Uh, short answer is no. Okay, but, great. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, long answer is there's tantalizing bits, but what happens is uh, what we're searching for are really rare, very strong effect alleles. So what that means is you have to find a second and a third person with the same reason for having a very severe outlier. So it's all about the numbers of people participating and finding multiple individual people. So everything that we're bound to find is going to individually be rare, but even though individually rare, it may be useful for the whole population. So that's sort of the general strategy for searching for the strong outliers. Okay. So you've done 23 and Me. Do you think we all should do 23 and Me? Of course I do. But, uh, I'm a little conflicted in recommending that. Yeah. I do think we can learn from 23 and Me about how we uh, might participate in sort of the citizen science model. I think there's mm -hmm. actually some good sides to it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, th I think the – what was this about? This – we're good to go for a Q and a Is that what you're telling – so – all right. I wish I had a phone that worked, and then I could have it in my pocket. We could go back to that. So you're not going to get over that one. So we're going to move to Q&A because the point 1K is coming up. I, I think, you know, I'd really love to talk about moving this field faster, further. I'd love to say to Stan, and I will. So Stan, if you had $10 million a day to invest it, where would you put it? I, like I don't have 10 million, but oh. try it anyway. All right. Uh, you know, I, I do think we have a vast amount to learn from uh, studying the biology of Duchenne. There's lots of things that we've left on the table. There's boys that are actually repairing their own mutations in their muscles, and we do not understand why that is. So even the simple revert and fiber aspect is not fully worked out, and yet boys are doing this routinely, and we have not studied that. Um, I would, you know, I would... Uh, focus on using uh, the, the tools of genomics in this enterprise. I think uh, some of the core therapies that we have ongoing are really devoted to that. So, you know, we know about exon skipping from understanding the genomics and the genetics of Becker and Duchenne uh, better, and then understanding, you know, spicing better and how you can modulate it has led to one of the, the new therapies, one of the few approved therapies. And there's just a lot of work to do in that regard. Uh, $10 million gets spent very quickly doing such yeah, things, I'm certain of that. <laughs> so do you think we know enough about dystrophin? I'm reminded about the dog model that has no dystrophin and seems to be quite healthy. Do you think we know enough about the protein? Uh, I, no, but I think, uh, you know, there'll be, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I think it's clear, you know, obviously the dystrophin protein is critically important for skeletal muscle and heart health and for various components in the brain, but we don't understand what its role is in the brain. We don't know how it contributes to the cognitive effects. I think, you know, certainly the, the vast amount of work done over the last 25 years in making a microdystrophin or a mini dystrophin in the various domains is informed by what was observed naturally, as we heard multiple times today, but exactly what that optimal form is not necessarily clear, but also, um, you know, uh, 
in the absence of dystrophin, you can mitigate the muscle disease quite a bit. That's a fantastic area to learn more about, because even if we're restoring partially functional dystrophin, we'd all like to do, have that work better. So just, yeah, yeah I think we'll be very, fo you know, if we can restore dystrophin, there's no question we should, but there's a lot of other components which we have not studied adequately yet. Yeah, so, I, so I'll just add my last two cents. Um, before we start into the gene therapy question and answers, I'd love to develop a protein signature. I'd love to understand the, in, in, the role of inflammation as it begins in, in the fetus and as it travels through the course of the disease. I'd love to be able to target therapies because I think if you could restore dystrophin and really control inflammation, I think that you, you might have a really significantly altered disease process. So we are really trying to consider that um, and trying to move forward in that area. So with that, I'm going to say thank you.